Hey everyone, welcome back to the news. Honestly, fascinating updates today. I mean, technically speaking, EA Games is sort of split up and it might actually be a good thing for some of us when you look into the new leadership structure. Didn't think I'd be saying that today. We've got Twitch following in YouTube steps of the feature for once, as well as some price hikes, which uh, it's not exactly what any of us want to hear, but I'll kick it off with our first story, which is Activision shutting down Warzone, the first one. So, Warzone 2 came out in November 2022. They renamed the original Warzone to Warzone Caldera after its latest map, and now they've announced that on September 21st, 2023, that the old Warzone will be removed from all stores. Um, so yes, not even after uh, after a full year. Now, the thing is, this is a game that had three games worth of microtransactions attached to it. Uh, those purchases still exist, they happen to exist within their own individual paid titles, um, but not from, of course, Warzone, the free-to-play uh, title, which is a little bit weird. Now, it does make sense from Activision's view, right? Uh, removing the game because Warzone 2 is actually reverting many of its things to be a bit more like Warzone 1, that does make sense, right? And I suppose they'll also just want to narrow the options for players who are like, you know, it's just ahead of this uh, new Call of Duty release. The more products they've got out there, especially ones are legacy and don't really play to their strategy, then the more confusing the entire thing is. But yes, uh, Warzone, that, uh, that first version of it that did very well is no longer going to be a thing. But I suppose the bright side is that the more controversial Warzone 2 has uh, basically been reverted back to being a bit more like Warzone 1. Next, though, price hikes, and it is for Xbox, but not just the Xbox. So if you're in the US, Japan, uh, Chile, Brazil, or Colombia, good news, no price hikes. Anywhere else, bad news, price hikes. Game Pass is going to be going up in price from $9.99 to $10.99 for console, and from $14.99 to $16.99 for Ultimate, with no change for PC. And while the Series S will remain as its current price, the Series X will be increasing. So in the UK, that's up to £479, €549, Euro. Uh, in Canada, $649, uh, and for Aussie dollars, 800 of them. That is what you will need to get an Xbox Series X. And uh, basically what they said, their head of comms uh, basically said that they've held their prices for many years and they've adjusted them to reflect the competitive conditions in each market. And this is actually broadly in line with what Phil Spencer said in late 2022, that eventually they were going to have to match the market rates because of increased costs. So I suppose like, you know, in inflation be a thing, right? Um, now, what is uh, noticeable though, is that these price increases are of course happening just before for a major Xbox system seller in the form of Starfield. So Starfield, it is going to be on Game Pass. So Game Pass is going up in price in a bunch of these territories. And of course, we'll be playing it on these new consoles. So if they do expect a whole big wave of consoles and new Game Pass subscriptions, I've got to imagine they would rather have that be at the higher price. Now, that being said, there are still a few levers that they uh, can pull, right? You've got the Xbox Ultimate Family Plan that is still in testing in some reasons, which uh, when it actually does come out, looks to be a significant value. But again, Will it change to reflect any of these price increases? Kind of tricky. Next, though, we've got a little bit about Twitch. So they're adding in something that uh, YouTube have had since 2017, and that is super chats. But they are being uh, they are being criticised for how they are doing the super chats. Which, of course, I mean, it's ov obviously it's Twitch. There, there's always a but. There's always a catch. There's always an extra thing uh, to comment on. So these will be between one and five hundred dollars per a minimum that is set by streamers. And and uh, yes, a message will be displayed, pinned on chat, that will have a style, uh, length, and duration that is depending on the amount of the donation. And this is going to be another revenue stream for Twitch partners. And it's not going to be opt-in, it's just uh, something I think is going to go out to everybody, which does have one little moderation uh, sort of quibble there. Of course, if these are set too low, then it could be a bit of a moderating problem. So there'll be something for people to do there. Um, but of course, what is interesting is how the 70-30 split that they actually do have with this feature is not the same as the 70-30 split that exists, um, that exists over in YouTube because... Uh, because it's not a true 70-30. They actually take an initial 5% of the total as a transaction uh, fee, like a payment processing fee, and then they take 30% of what is left. So Twitch are getting more 
then they're getting more than 30%. That is absolutely the case. Whereas over in YouTube, it's a 70-30 split. And uh, the, the, the part of that, though, that is payment processing, YouTube actually handle that. Now, your payment processing fees are more like 25 to 3%, so Twitch taking 5% is definitely them leaving like a little bit of margin or at least some, uh, you know, uh, sort of room to wiggle with uh, in that. Now, there is one other thing that I thought was fascinating. Remember recently we talked about the new Twitch Partnership Plus thing, where it's basically like a not for small partners, not for big partners, but for people who are in the middle, it would give them a better revenue split. Well, the thing was, it was for 350 subs, but that didn't include gifted subs or uh, Twitch Prime subs. So actually, uh, Stream Charts did an analysis, and they found that out of a total of 42,366 active Twitch partners, that 1,066 would be eligible per those criteria. And I think for a lot of people, that's surprising. Especially if you're not really, like, deep in Twitch culture, you might not know that, like, in, in some cases, way over half of somebody's subscriptions are going to be gifted or Twitch Prime, which, of course, do not count to this. So only 2.5% of uh, Twitch partners actually fall within this Partner Plus program. And that really just does go to show how tiny, like, how tiny of a slice of people that it impacts. So I think for Twitch, like, this is 2.5% of their partners, which is obviously not a terrible amount of money in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it, it's only that small amount. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that this is, you know, in reality, the PR win that they wanted to project across the market. Uh, I, I just do not think that that is reflected by the uh, the scope of, uh, you know, of their total uh, just number of partners that actually fall into the scheme, which does leave the whole thing, I think, feeling rather hollow. You would far rather have something that was more like a small streamer support thing where uh, I suppose the people who could actually really truly in their day-to-day -day life benefit from that better deal where it would maybe preferentially target them. And for Twitch, you could maybe say that if it was easier for streamers to go full-time, there would be more full-time streamers on Twitch, and that that would be good for Twitch's business model in the long run because they would be getting more content. Um, but, you know, uh, no, it ain't that. I suppose maybe they want this to be something that is good for not the top of the top, but definitely for the, okay, literally not the 1%, but they probably want this to be very good for the people that fall in it so they don't just go look, uh, look at YouTube gaming or, you know, YouTube live streams and uh, be enticed to go over there because they're happy with, uh, you know, Twitch has got all the cultural benefits in terms of its tipping culture and all of that, but also uh, they fall within that scheme. Two and a half percent. I mean, is that more than you thought or less than uh, you thought? I thought it would be small, but I honestly thought it would have been like 5% of partners falling into that. Not a measly two and a half, kind of crazy. Uber quick bit of self-promo and also PSA. Our game, The Pale Beyond, uh, number one, sort of cool thing. We've got a 96% in our recent reviews in Steam, which we're all pretty chuffed about, uh, but it's 20% off uh, right now. So if you want to pick up The Pale Beyond um, at 20% off or the like digital collector's edition that's got like, you know, music, digital art book, that kind of thing, I think it's actually more like 33 or something like that percent off. So you can check those out on Steam. The link will be down below. And with that said, back to the news. Next then, EA Games. Technically, it's no more. There are two brands now. It's got two separate groups in terms of uh, a bit of a, a bit of a restructuring where we've got EA Sports under Cam uh, Werber. Uh, this is, or Weber, this is uh, all the sports games and all the racing games. But then we've got EA Entertainment under Laura Melee. Now, here's the thing about Laura. Generally speaking, we like her. And it seemed like she did a very good job. And uh, I, I think it was the year after she got a very, she did a very good job. Her bonus went up to like 16 million or something crazy. But anyway, <laughs> that aside, um, Laura was heavily involved in the whole process that went around uh, basically creating the strike team to fix up Star Wars Battlefront 2. That was obviously successful. She's been talking a lot about like empowering the creatives, talking a lot about learning positive lessons from Respawn Entertainment. So it generally seems like she's been a positive force uh, at EA in terms of the games that we actually play, right? So for everything else then, uh, Vince Sampella is in charge of Apex, Star Wars, and Battlefield. Samantha Ryan will be handling their lifestyle franchises like Skate, uh, The Sims, as well as some of their blockbuster single player games like Dead Space and under Jeff Karp, mobile games shall happen. Um, so is this just rearranging some deck chairs, right? Like, yeah, I, I suppose it is. Um, I suppose that the thing that I would like to see, though, is like a, a dividing line. 
so far, EA Sports is where all the really bad stuff has happened with, you know, the microtransactions, FIFA Ultimate Team, all that shitty stuff that we don't like. I suppose if they technically are like two different groups within the company, maybe you could, maybe you could hopium that uh, the EA Entertainment bit won't really go as bad. Um, I mean, certainly when you look at the EA Entertainment slate, they're bringing a lot of resources into Battlefield. They are extending the life of Battlefield 2042 beyond what players expected with more content than people expected after they did actually put quite a lot of work into fixing that up. So it seems like they have a fairly decent, um, you know, commitment to that brand. You've got everything that Respawn touches being great, like Jedi Survivor, yes, launch problems, but also really terrific game, Apex Legends, terrific game, the Dead Space remake, terrific game. Like they have actually been on a fairly good streak, but we do have another EA game and that is Immortals of Avium, which to be honest, um, it's a bit weird where, you know, their whole tagline is like, become a battle mage or a battle magi of the Triarch to stop the ever war. And it's like, oh man, you're, you're giving me such an assault of like, you know, proper nouns and things that I, what is the ever war? Who knows? Uh, but it does seem to be this uh, supposedly very narratively rich uh, shooter experience where it very much does look like you're just kind of shooting different colors of magic. I don't know, like it, it definitely looks like there's a lot of graphics, but I haven't been that sure about the game itself. But anyway, it's been delayed. Uh, it's been delayed uh, a month before its launch. They say that they want to polish the game, but when you uh, look at that, you know, you look at the delay, you look at it being a month, it, to me, it just feels like, yeah, uh, sorry guys, we failed platform certification. <laughs> we, we barely got Jedi Survivor out with that performance, and now Immortals of Avium isn't going to work. I mean, literally, who knows? But rather than the 20th of July, this will be coming out on the 22nd of August. And looking through the recent previews, they have been from positive to uh, rather cool in terms of reception. I don't mean cool as in, whoa, that's cool. I mean cool as in, you know, not a hot reception. Uh, we will see. People are broadly sort of saying it's uh, more of like a mid-2000s first-person shooter. Maybe not always in a good way. I don't know. It doesn't really look like a demo is too strong to me. At least I can say that. Okay, as for our... Um, Final two stories then. The first, Halo Infinite has stopped making its narrative cutscenes for its seasons, which to a lot of people just seems like, ah, oh, great, another thing's being stripped out of the game. In this case, they basically just said that the narrative cutscenes were not worth the effort and they would rather just put the efforts of their game teams onto game systems and actual content. There are some leaks then that um, basically just show that these actually took quite a lot of time. So, uh, it was a leak that was detailing the various responsibilities um, across 343 Industries and their outsourcing partners to making these, between like script writing, audio mixing, music, character rigging, level branch setup, uh, engineer, build, graphic support, creative feedback, SKU performance, cinematic direction, mocap, animation, lighting, FX, geometry work, character work, uh, object character rigging, UI creation, bug fixing, just all of these different things that came in to, uh, to make these seasonal um, you know, these like seasonal things. And the crazy thing is that apparently a new cutscene that required new environments uh, and assets could take up to 24 weeks to produce. And I think when you then regard Halo Infinite, you're like, really 24 weeks? That doesn't seem to be the most, uh, the most useful uh, way to deploy your resources. But apparently in a pinch, they could actually get one done in as quick as three months. Yeah, so these resources are going to be free for uh, work elsewhere. And finally, as our little happy story finishes, uh, finishes off with, EVE Online has long been called Spreadsheets in Space. Well now, it literally has an official integration with Microsoft Excel. Yes. Um, there are actual spreadsheets in space. Here's uh, here's what they say. CCP, uh, CCP Games has extensive experience in the MMO space. It's only natural that we collaborate with them to launch the first ever native Microsoft Excel add-on for a video game. With the add-in, EVE Online, uh, the EVE Online player base can seamlessly export and manage data without third-party tools. So, you know, here we've got like uh, calculating your profits for manufacturing, overviews of markets. It seems that you can just like even analyzing your skill points you can just pull the data from me via an official uh, integration that is so cool 
That is so cool. I mean, for economic games, we always use spreadsheets, um, even in the likes of, say, World of Warcraft, you know, for calculating the profitability of your various different shovels. You will have an Excel spreadsheet for that. So I think the idea then that uh, you can log into EVE Online in Microsoft Excel is, uh, it is beyond funny, and I think it's a cool little story to end us with. So that's it for today. Of course, if you would uh, like to support what we do, definitely hit that subscribe button, because whenever I say to hit subscribe, people actually do it, and the number goes up, which is pretty crazy. And if you want to actually get the news when it still is news, then ring that bell and select uh, all notifications. And with that said, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.